Well, good afternoon. Um, I'm pleased to be part of this discussion, and uh, I did not make a disclosure slide, so I will tell you that at any given time, I work with between two and three dozen companies, uh, whether small biopharm or large multinational pharmaceutical companies. Um, most importantly for this type of discussion, I'm agnostic with respect to mechanism. And so, though I was invited in the amyloid session to talk about an anti-amyloid approach, um, that's not a particular focus or concentration for me. It's one of many things that I work on. If there's anything that I speak about where I, I have a uh, financial interest, I'll certainly mention that. Um, I would like then to talk about the monoclonal antibodies eventually, but I would like to place them in the context of other things. And as somebody who is both a clinical scientist and um, a person interested in uh, anthropology and cognition, um, I think we start with the epidemiology, we go to the laboratory, and somewhere we come in the middle uh, when we're actually treating people for disease. So there are many risk factors for sporadic Alzheimer's disease listed here. In every population in the world, a driving factor is aging. Is there one thing about aging that promotes the development of Alzheimer's disease? Certainly throughout these days of this conference, you would come away with the conclusion that there is not. But oxidative metabolism and the handling of accumulated, damaged, misfolded, or extra proteins probably has something to do with the susceptibility conferred by aging. Menopause is a promoter in women though it is not an inevitability. Genetics, what I think we're learning about that is that there are rare variations and not so rare variations that are cumulative in the risk that they confer on an individual to developing Alzheimer's disease. Someone asked a few moments ago about diabetes and glucose, and I don't even know if he's still here, but uh, yes, uh, diabetes and hyperglycemia and metabolic state in middle age promotes the risk, increases the risk of Alzheimer's disease later on, as does elevated cholesterol, as does elevated blood homocysteine, a normal blood protein that everyone has. But uh, we find that in a clinic population, the prevalence of hyperhomocysteinemia is equal to the prevalence of ApoE4 positivity. And I feel that this is probably a very significant and modifiable risk factor. Major head injury with loss of consciousness fortunately does not affect many people, but those at whom it affects, it increases the risk. And finally, the latest to be added to the list is chronic inflammation. Um, why and how and what aspect of hyperinflammatory process promotes the risk of Alzheimer's disease is not clear. But uh, epidemiologic data clearly support chronic overstimulation of the of the immune system through even accumulated diseases of aging promotes the risk. All right, so um, the pathologic factors involved in Alzheimer's disease going away from the epidemiologic perspective to the pathology would suggest multiple interventions. Clearly plaques and tangles have something to do with Alzheimer's disease. Uh, they are necessary, uh, they are not sufficient because you can have many plaques and tangles, Brock stage two, even some people would say Brock stage three, and have no cognitive loss, okay? Even if you were assessed within a year of your death. So just having plaques and tangles is not sufficient to have Alzheimer's disease. Well, the hypothesis is that that's because people differ in their brain reserve or their cognitive reserve so that we can withstand different disease burdens before we become symptomatic with disease. And what the exact mechanisms and basis of cognitive reserve might be are, are a topic on their own, um, but, but it is a factor. And in our work, um, your premorbid IQ seems to be something of a um, an estimate of your cognitive reserve and does influence the rates of progression once you have disease. The biochemistry of aging, all of those factors that we were talking about, redox, maybe metal um, 
accumulation or deficiencies. Uh, other, other aspects of biochemistry clearly promote the disease and our targets. And, and maybe every one of them is a target or maybe some are better than others. And that's one of the confusing things about a symposium like this. Everything seems to be an equal target. Genetic background in humans as in animals makes a difference in terms of how likely we are to progress with a disease. And bad habits, especially those that promote cardiovascular disease risk in middle age, some of which I mentioned from the epidemiology, are, are a point of, of intervention, as is um, chronic inflammation. I don't want to have a talk about therapy without saying something about current therapies. There are current therapies for Alzheimer's disease. And in most settings, particularly those in which people are working very hard to develop their own approaches, um, we have a tendency to begin by saying that current treatments are ineffective, or they only work for six months or um, they don't work at all, or they only work for some people. Uh, I can tell you that um, not only cholinesterase inhibitors and the NMDA receptor antagonist memantine have held up to multiple rigorous trials of safety and efficacy, have held up to meta-analyses. Um, they do improve the lot of people who are affected with Alzheimer's disease. So does high-dose vitamin E. And uh, the early studies that we were involved in that showed it was a benefit of high-dose vitamin E, 1,000 units twice a day, couldn't tell why. We still don't know why. But the outcome in which vitamin E was most efficacious was a composite outcome that included progression from moderate to severe and included survival and nursing home placement. So it's something about function. The most recent study by Diskin et al. from the VA system published just this year, confirmed the same thing, that there was an effect of high-dose vitamin E and that it was an effect on function, helping to preserve function. And then there are medications for the behavioral and psychological symptoms of dementia that uh, I will not be covering. So how effective are these current treatments? They hold up to rigorous analysis. We don't have as much information as we would like about their long-term benefits. A number of groups, including ours, have populations in which we can look at this question. And um, our group, uh, Ali Atri at uh, Mass General, Oscar Lopez at University of Pittsburgh, Dr. Watmo from Denmark, numerous groups have come to the conclusion that for about as long as you can measure it, as long as you keep people persistently on adequate doses of treatment, they do better than people who are not treated. Why is this important? Well, we are talking about that background for the development of new therapies. I also think that it's time to add technology, particularly wearable or implantable technologies, um, as potential therapeutic interventions in memory disorders and Alzheimer's disease. I think there is a very strong future for this and that the effect sizes will be as great as at least the therapies that we have now. So is there one pathway to target for treating Alzheimer's disease? Uh, the very first academic lecture I gave when I started in, um, in my career was attended by my chairman, and the very first statement I made uh, was that after really studying the literature, I didn't think there was a single target for Alzheimer's disease. And he said, I'm going to have to interrupt and stop you right there because um, I strongly believe that amyloid is the single target for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and that was a very hard way to get started. So is there an initiating event? Now, I can see many ways that we can think about the initiating event theory. If I had to go that way, if I decided to wear that hat, what I would say is that there are probably multiple hits. So we have data that I've been peripherally involved in with um, Pre, uh, perinatal anoxia or even prenatal anoxia and its effect on later amyloid accumulation in transgenic mice. Um, very early events may be a first hit and then a later hit starts off a cascade. And maybe that cascade is something like amyloid accumulation. Maybe it's just proteinopathy 
and propagation of various proteins and that they're different for different people, whether you happen to get tau or amyloid or alpha-synuclein. But there may be a, an initiating event of some type or a, a couple of hits. So that is a theory. Um, and and it's, if that's your theory, then you're going to pursue one route toward remediation. Then there's the brain failure theory, which is really probably where I fall. Um, and, and here, I believe that there's an interaction between your susceptibilities and your habits and the biology of aging, and that it leads to aberrant processes, protein accumulations, including A, beta, and tau, and other brain changes, and with the qualifier that, you know, just like mice, um, our background, our genetic background makes a difference. It's easier to show this in some strains than in others. So the strategies as I see them for remediating Alzheimer's disease and disorders related to that, including the earlier stages of mild cognitive impairment and prodromal dementia then, would include drugs or nutraceuticals that are based upon epidemiologic observations. I think there's still a role for that, and someone raised that issue this morning. Neurotransmitter-based therapies, all of the therapies that are approved, that work, that seem to persist in their effects, and I didn't say this, but in our center, we have made it a habit to follow people until they die. So we follow about 80% of our patients until they die, and we keep up with everyone throughout their life by six-month checks with the National Death Registry. And we think that there is a long-lasting impact of neurotransmitter-based therapies, though they are not curative and would not be considered by most people to be disease-modifying. Gliomodulating drugs might be the effector through which we can tune innate immunity. Neuroprotective, uh, metabolic, regenerative approaches, they tend to overlap because the way the agent behaves depends on the model in which you use it. So I, I group these together sometimes. Tau modulating and amyloid modulating drugs. I have written elsewhere that we should not maintain a distinction between symptomatic and disease-modifying therapies. This is as much a social construction as it is a scientific one. And if you want to read about that, you, you can. Um, but if we were thinking from a drug development perspective, there are a couple things worth highlighting about this contrast. So if a drug is considered symptomatic, we expect something from that drug. We expect it to improve the patient's symptoms. And we expect it to do that rather in the short term, but then we're sure the person will go on to decline over time. It usually acts in weeks or months. Dinepazil has data that the effect is present by three weeks. And it's not as valuable because it's only symptomatic. And so those who are working to develop such a therapy can expect a lower rate of reimbursement for that treatment. Contrast that with disease-modifying drugs. In these, we may see no improvement at all in any patient, and it could still be classified as a disease-modifying drug. But it would slow decline with a widening drug placebo difference over time. So imagine explaining this to a patient. We want you to take this better drug. You will never see a difference, but it will slow your disease. And it may take nearly a year, at least based on the things that I'll show you about what we've learned from clinical trials so far. So we tell them, and you, we won't really know if it's working for about a year. And um, society and, and the factors that relate to reimbursement would consider it more valuable, and it would cost more. So in a way, what we've done is kind of lowered the bar for demonstration of efficacy for things that we want to call disease-modifying. And I think that's kind of a double-edged sword. What have we actually learned from recent clinical trials? Well, we've learned that transmitter-based therapies continue to show clinical signals 
of potential efficacy. Now, I'm not going to make a comment or a value judgment about how good a signal, how strong a signal, how predictive a signal. Let's just talk about whether there's a signal. And in uh, ST101, which, is a, which was initially developed as a cholinergic drug, a, a, um, a choline-releasing drug, was later shown in uh, Frank LaFerla's lab to have effects on modifying APP metabolism, causing an alternative cleavage. Well, ST101 may have shown a signal. Now, uh, EVP6124 and ABT126 are both alpha-7 nicotinic agonists. Both of them showed similar drug placebo differentiation in short, short trials designed along the model of symptomatic treatments, especially on the background of cholinesterase inhibitors. Similarly, um, Two different drugs that are 5-HTC, uh, I'm sorry, 5-HT6 receptor antagonists have shown similar types of cognitive and possibly global signals. Vitamin E, as I mentioned, helps slow functional decline. Why does it do that? Is it membrane stabilization? Is it some general antioxidant effect? It doesn't seem like it's the latter. We don't know. We've also learned from numerous trials, particularly trials funded by the NIH, unfortunately, because there were not proprietary forces to drive these studies, so they were taken on by the Alzheimer's Disease Cooperative Study, which I serve on the steering committee, and it's an NIH trials group. We've, sh we've shown that if you take a, take a potential therapy that you would derive from the epidemiologic data, and introduce it in people with Alzheimer's disease, something that seems to promote risk or decrease risk, and you use it as a treatment, it doesn't work. And that would include non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, estrogen, B vitamins and folate to lower blood homocysteine, statins to lower blood cholesterol, both one that penetrates the brain well and one that does not, and DHA as a general omega-3 um, fatty acid, these don't work, and they don't work to slow progression if you introduce them once somebody has disease. And finally, I agree uh, with a, an earlier speaker from today that placebo groups are not behaving as they used to. And we've seen this in numerous studies, including some I was involved with, with a, a mitochondrial stabilizing drug called Dimabon. Um, we see placebo groups that improve. We see placebo groups that don't decline. I have a colleague who would say we can explain all of that methodologically, that it has to do with the number of times you assess the subjects, the duration of the study, but many of us don't think it's just methodological. We think that, that there's something different about um, the, the way the disease is actually progressing, and it may be because we're identifying it earlier on average when more people are in a plateau. It may be because background treatments of general medical disorders are better. For whatever reason, placebo groups are not declining the way they did. Now moving more toward the anti-amyloid strategies. Again, there are many strategies, and uh, these are some of them. The passive antibodies, and I group those with IVIG, which contains many native anti-amyloid antibodies. Um, very interesting array of them. Well, um, several of these studies, with the line through them, are, are not going forward. They failed to show um, drug placebo benefits on cognition and global function and daily functioning um, in large, well-designed clinical trials. Solonazumab and cronizumab I will say more about. Active monoclonal antibody vaccines. Well, again, um, you know, we have Dal Shank here who started this all off. Um, so far, we, we haven't been able to get the benefit we're looking for. CAD106 recently reported out its data, and I think, you know, it really takes some scrutiny to decide is there a signal there or is there not, but this is going forward into other populations. Antifibrillization or anti-aggregation or altered cleavage strategies. Um, Skyloinositol would fall here, um, ST101. 
Uh, both may have shown a signal. Again, it depends on the interpreter. And then the gamma and beta secretase inhibitors, we've clearly learned that gamma secretase inhibition, um, at least as we've been able to achieve it so far, is not safe and uh, has not gone forward in, in further human studies with additional agents, but um, the beta secretase inhibitors are going forward. Things tend to make it to my list here if they're in an established human study beyond phase one. So there are other beta secretase inhibitors um, that, that are not yet on the list, but they're coming. So what can we say now focusing in on the monoclonal antibodies, which um, I guess is the main thing I was asked to come here and talk about. So bapinuzumab is a humanized anti-beta amyloid monoclonal antibody. Um, we used to talk a lot about what's the antigenic target, because this is something that differentiates the monoclonals. It's it's binding fibrillar A-beta. Um, it therefore binds to plaque. It targets the N-terminal domain, and it promotes clearance of A-beta from the brain, and does that pretty well in transgenics. Um, we knew from the phase two trials that a side effect of this approach um, could be vasogenic edema and microhemorrhages, especially frequent in ApoE4 positive individuals and at the higher doses as opposed to lower doses. And let me just say before I get into the monoclonal antibody part here that I'm, I'm considering this sort of a critical review. So I hope nobody takes it personally. <laughs> um, it's a critical review of what, what do we know and what have we learned and where do we have to go. Solanazumab, another humanized anti-beta amyloid monoclonal antibody binds soluble A-beta. That's different. It's not binding the plaques mostly monomeric binding, targeting the mid-region or central domain, again promotes clearance from the brain. I remember when the venture capitalists used to call and, you know, what they wanted to know is, well, if it's N-terminal, if it's mid-domain, you know, what's the difference? What difference is, is that? Is that what is going to tell us, you know, whether it's better or not? And I remember insisting, no matter how many times I was asked, that we just didn't know if that made any difference at all. So we'll see what you think. Um, Solanazumab was hypothesized to be less likely to produce vasogenic edema in the preclinical studies um, compared to those that targeted the N-terminus. Okay. Cronezumab, another humanized antibody. Um, this is on an IgG4 framework, and that was designed that way by AC Immune to um, try to avoid overactivation of microglial cells which they still were concerned about in the monoclonals, binds monomeric, oligomeric, and fibrillar A-beta. So either that's really good or that's really nonspecific. Again, it's central domain, but it has both linear and conformational binding. What have we learned from these recent monoclonal antibody studies? Um, well, in the case of bapinuzumab, there were two large negative phase three studies each with over 1,000 patients. Now, when you say there's a large negative phase three study, that's simply something that's required. You have to say that because the study did not meet its primary outcomes. And in the clinical world, you know, anytime you seem to be shading the truth, you know, that's, that's bad. So on the other hand, when you say there were two large negative phase three trials, it doesn't mean we didn't learn anything from them. And I think that's very important to keep in mind. Um, now, with BAPI, there were no clinical benefits in any group examined or in any subgroup. And I'm going to say subgroup from, from the top couple of levels of analysis. I think if you, there are some analyses that have been reported where you might say there was a signal. It may have lowered PTAL. Um, some believe on the basis of some sub-studies that it also lowered amyloid accumulation. We'll talk briefly about it. The overview on SOLA, solanazumab, two large negative phase three studies, each with over 1,000 patients. So both studies, very big. Benefits on cognition, um, I think the signal is there, especially in the mild patients, and maybe even in benefits on function in the combined studies. That's a view, and that's selective. It did lower free A-beta-40 and increase total A-beta-40 in the CSF, 
with very large excursions in A beta 40 and 42 in plasma. So again, I'm giving you an overview before we look at the data. And finally, cronezumab, the one that was very recently reported at the Alzheimer's Association International Conference in Copenhagen. Two small negative phase two studies. Phase two studies. This was the first look for efficacy. One of them had about 444 patients in it, one only 91. It was mainly a biomarker study. But both are worth looking at because even though these are negative studies, there is something to be learned. The benefits, in my view, were there in a subgroup who were treated with the IV or higher dose of this antibody and the, the subgroup who were mild patients. And this is based upon a stratification strategy that I will tell you about. And the biomarker data are pending. So I've, I've borrowed, because I, I, I have a lot of familiarity with the, these data sets, I'm restricting myself simply to what was reported in the public domain by uh, Dr. Jeff Cummings in Copenhagen. Okay, so what do these possible signals look like? With respect to bapinusumab, the studies were divided based upon APOE genotype, because we already knew that there was a differential safety signal in phase two. Do any of the pointers work? Yeah, okay. So um, here we're looking at change in CSF phosphotal by treatment group at week 71. This is the, the study of carriers. And reduction would be anything below the zero point here, okay, reduced levels. Well, CSF tau in the placebo group really didn't change over that 71 weeks. Should it have? Well, there's very little longitudinal data on CSF measures. Um, if you look at the literature, which the last time I did a year or so ago, yeah, there's, there's often an excursion of six picograms per ml or so. Um, what happened in the treated group, which received only the lower dose because they were E4 positive, about a six picogram per ml decrease. And was this everybody in the study? No, it was a very small, I said over 1,000 patients in the study, 85 placebo, 127 drug. So this is a very select group of people who were in this study. And this is what we saw. What about the non-carriers who did not have APOE? Here we're looking at two different doses versus placebo, and one of the doses is the same as the dose we just looked at on the other slide. That dose did not differentiate from placebo. Again, we're looking at a very small subset of subjects, over 1,000 in the study, 77 placebo, 47 low dose, 54 high dose. The higher dose, about an eight picogram per ml decline. Honestly, I don't know what to make of that. I think it's a small number of people from a very large study with small degree of change that wasn't consistent across the dose. What about um, amyloid burden as assessed by PIB PET? This is carriers. This is placebo of about 75 people. I'm sorry, placebo of about 75 people. Um, and and that's the dotted line, and the bapinusumab group. No change in the bapinusumab group. At the last interval between week 45 and 71, some possible 0.08 uh, decline in SUVR. Now, I, I won't go into it today, but if you really look across the literature, there's no convincing evidence that we've really seen amyloid levels go down in anybody. There are two or three potential candidates in whom it may have gone down with gantanarumab. Changes in amyloid burden, again, CPIB pet APOE4 non-carriers this time, so you're looking at two different doses versus placebo. Placebo is still the dotted line. Um, same dose we were looking at before, the 0.5 milligram per kilogram. Well, it's hard to say, it made a slight change and came back. The higher dose, um, 0.08, okay. 
Okay, I'm getting a bell, so I've got to hurry. Okay. I have to stop? Okay. All right, well, I mentioned large excursions with solanazumab of uh, plasma A beta. I'm going to just show you a table of efficacy here that convinced me that there is a signal. And in bold are the primary outcomes, which are clearly negative. But numerous other looks at cognition and function in the milder subpopulations or the pooled data reach significant differences. The Cronezumab study, the most important thing I'll tell you, because there's not time to discuss in detail, is that the overall study included MMSE of 18 to 26, and everything was negative. The analysis pre-specified that the mild group would be MMSE of 20 to 26, and although you see separation of drug and placebo, most of those did not reach statistical significance. However, the stratification used in the study to bring in an equal number of mild and moderate patients was around an MMSE of 22, not 20. So this was also looked at, and you start to see significant differences on multiple measures. The very small trial didn't reach much significance, but shows similar types of graphs for the higher dose. The safety must be mentioned. Bapanusumab did have some REAE, some amyloid-related imaging abnormalities with edema in a fair percentage of patients, especially for positive. There were numerical imbalances of unknown significance in solanazumab and cronezumab regarding uh, certain observations, ischemic heart disease, arrhythmias, and pneumonia. So the overall impressions. Um, the effect, if present, is small. The effect may take several months to become apparent. It may be larger in mild patients. And there's evidence, in my view, that targeting A-beta may benefit mild to moderate patients. Many people have looked at the same data and come to the conclusion that mild to moderate is too late. I don't agree with that. I think that if you have a therapy that only works in people who aren't sick, it probably doesn't work very strongly. However, the theory that you must go earlier is being tested in the studies that are listed here for each of the different monoclonal antibodies and, and some of the base inhibitors, and there should be another one added um, based upon recent data. So because I'm over time, I'll stop, and thank you for your patience.